What we're going to do is uh, real He's quick introductions of everybody here on the panel. Risk. And then uh, if you'd start lining up at the microphone over here in the aisle, and uh, we're just going to open it up to questions in about two minutes. So I'm Jim Christie. I'm from the Department of Defense Cyber Crime Center. I'm Mark Sox, and from the Fed side, uh, retired DOD, used to work at the White House, used to work at DHS, now at Verizon. <laughs> Is there a difference? <laughs> he's, he's always getting fired up. That's good. Rich Marshall, warrior lawyer, uh, legal architect, for eligible re receiver 97, uh, currently the director of global cybersecurity for the Department of Homeland Security, and we're here to help you. Good afternoon. My name is Riley Repko. I work for uh, the Department of the Air Force, but I'm now detailed to the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Hi, John I. Um I'm from the Navy SEAL teams. I now do uh, independent work. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I dare you ask a stupid fucking question. <laughs> Randy Vickers, Director U.S. CERT, former Director of DOD CERT. Colonel Mike Convertino, U.S. Air Force. I'm commander of the 318th Information Operations Group. Andrew Freed, former IRS agent and actually uh, with TIGDA. Retired two years. Jerry Dixon, former director of the uh, National Cybersecurity Division, now with uh, Team Cymru. Lynn Wells, National Defense University, former DOD Chief Information Officer. Kevin Manson, uh, point term cyber cop, retired DHS. Okay. It's open to you guys. You need questions. We got got to line up at the microphone right behind you. I was listening. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Hacker pays attention. <laughs> the Air Force Colonel. Um, in your testing, what have you ever had a team fight back on the network? Not just like sit there and watch them or watch you, you know, penetrate their network, but actually fight back against you. And if they did, what did they do? You mean in, in pen testing, when we do our pen testing? Yeah, pen testing or red, te red team testing. Have oh. you ever had anyone fight back as opposed to just watching you come in and own their network? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we have some really stellar professionals at some of our bases. So um, I do own uh, underneath me a, a pen testing unit, uh, the Air Force's pen testing unit. And so, yeah, we've had plenty of times where um, our, our professionals at various different Air Force bases have, have pushed back uh, against some, some of the hacks that we were pushing forward. Mm -hmm. Have any of them been particularly effective or are you just able to just run through them? Um, actually, the, it, it, over time, uh, the, the skill levels of our, our pros have, have really gotten much, much better. Um, uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, things were a little iffy uh, from that point of view, um, but things have gotten dramatically better. So between yeah mid 90s and now, it's it's you wouldn't recognize it. It's okay. much better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, this one's for the IRS guy. I just wanted to know when my taxes are going to be going down. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. What was your social security number? Uh, <laughs> Three nine four seven four two seven six eight. We'll send you an email with a request for your credit card. We'll just refund it there. <laughs> that was Kevin Mitnick's social security. So uh, <clears throat> I uh, I see a lot of X so and so up there. Um, I have a bit of experience in the government world before I went X, and I'm fairly young. So I'm curious uh, if all of you guys retired or if you quit because it's just totally foobard like me. Well, let's everybody take that. So I'm not an ex. But go ahead. So I retired, and then I worked, and then I worked, then I quit. I, I'm curious um, if any of the reasons quit just because, you know, nothing, I don't want to say nothing ever gets done, but it's so hard to get no, stuff done. Honestly, too frustrating. It was right. the early days of DHS, and uh, things were too frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> he said, hasn't, hasn't changed. changed. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry. Riley. I'm, I'm in a different role. I spent 25 years out in the private sector, and now I'm in uh, 17 months working for the, uh, the deputy secretary because uh, my focus is trying to leverage all the wizards out there because I'm surrounded by a bunch of knuckleheads. And uh, 
the opportunity here is to be able, and I, I say that pejoratively, the, you bring so much to the table, but the key is how do I leverage and incentivize the capabilities that are out in the private sector? And so I'm building that engagement roadmap, and I'm going to share that with you in my next presentation. So if you're in the special operations community, you have to be 100 percent or you shouldn't be in the community. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm in a different category here. I, I got shot and was wounded and had to go do other things. Uh, so Yeah, I figured you're kind of different. <laughs> but it, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> you're different. Might be the short call. How come chicks tell me that too? I don't get it. <laughs> Uh, I actually spent 20 years and uh, retired. I'm trying to think of the word that tells me why I, I quit. I, I, oh. uh, working for the government is uh, it's difficult, especially if you just have a low threshold for bullshit. And uh, I, since I've retired, I, I've come back like a Jedi Knight, you know, in a different life, probably more powerful than before. I'm not inhibited by rules, policies, procedures, or as some would say, morals. But uh, I've stayed involved in the uh, cybercrime world. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm, I'm a researcher with Paul Vixie's group, ISC, and I also have a, my own consultancy. But we are still working very closely with law enforcement because we're able to now gather data that as law enforcement I never could have done legally before. So. Yeah, I think you know, everybody else kind of summed it up with regards to you know, frustration stuff. I mean, it gets to the point where uh, if, if you're not going to be able to continue to make a, a substantial impact or execute on certain things. I, I mean, I, you know, I feel it, especially for Randy, because I know what he's up against, it's a very challenging environment. It takes a lot more effort than you would in the private sector. So, you know, th there's some challenges, but at the same time, there's a lot of good things that you get to do in government that you can't do anywhere else. Yeah, like read people's emails. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. So, uh, Instead of all the investment in cyber warfare, has anyone thought it might be a good idea to set up a system sort of like the FDA to stop shitty products and services from ever hitting the market? So. Sure. I like that idea, but I, you know, I think a common theme that we've just heard is one of frustration and uh, think of the execution of that idea. Like how does, how does that construct work? How do you get people to review the sheer volume of data coming in? Um, I'd like you to take your idea and maybe explore a crowdsourcing model behind it. Uh, I think that's a, good, uh, that's a good idea though. The other challenge is the scale of being able to test. If you think about what the FDA does, they're focusing on a certain type of, of drug or, or food product that's very focused. If you're talking about an operating system or some other system that has to be configurable to many different missions and many different things, the scalability of testing each one of those configurations to meet all the other mission impacts virtually impossible. Yeah, but you, you look at how much money goes into the attack part of the research and it just seems like if you stop it from ever even getting to the point where things are widely deployed, it seems like a much cheaper fix. But yeah, but I think I'd like to follow up on John's point with that is that the, the solution in this space is not something the government can do by itself. It's got to be a public-private sort of whole of government transnational approach to this problem. There's not enough spare cycles uh, among the people in government to get to the, say, the amount of code that's out there. And besides, which folks in this room are a lot closer to the problem than we're ever going to be. So I would love to be a way to take the approach you're talking about and get more involvement out of the, you know, the tremendous skill and enthusiasm in places like this to make a partnership out of it rather than a wee day. And, and let me take a, a slightly different uh, tack on that particular question. Uh, in my current position, which is the second best job I've ever had in the, air, in the, in the world, and that's why I do what I do. Uh, one of the, the scary things that really, well, I, I sleep like a baby at night, so I don't worry that much. I wake up every two hours crying. He drinks a lot, that's why. He drinks why. a lot. Yeah. Well, that helps. Um, but just to kind of to, to spend a little bit on, on your particular idea, we need to spend more money both on the private sector and the public sector on research and development, basic research and development, uh, to counter a lot of the cyber security issues. The American public, the people, not a government, but the American public, spends more money on astrology than the U.S. government spends on basic R&D and cyber security. We need to reverse that trend. I'd like to add a comment that 
part, part of the frustration isn't knowing what's happening. I think Stevie Wonder could look at a network and know it's bad. The problem is mitigating it. What can we do about it? That's where the frustration comes in. We don't need a lot of research to know what's happening. We have thousands of people that will tell us. Some of us are part of those people that are doing it. It's mitigation that's a problem. Question. Next question. This question is for anyone that may have ever participated in a raid against a hacker's home. Uh, Ooh. Ha any, you know, any raid against a hacker's house, if you guys have been in one, um, have they ever violently resisted, possibly with firearms, and what would be the outcome of that? How would that possibly, <laughs> how would that possibly affect the policy in future? It's death. I hear predictions yeah. on the walk. Yeah, the Undertaker gets well. Taking odds on that one. <laughs> yeah. Their username would no longer Sell exist. Sell your guns I know now. <laughs> uh, generally, they're very cooperative, very polite, and uh, things usually go very smoothly on those. Why? Well, because we have guns and they don't. <laughs> what if they did? It would get noisy. So it doesn't sound like that has ever happened before. I, I've been on probably uh, 40 or 50 search warrants in the fi final five years of my career, and I've, we've never had a problem. I mean, we go in there professionally, we talk professionally, and uh, you know, we have a warrant from a magistrate, and I mean, that's not the time to fight a problem. The time to fight is in the courtroom. You know, you go in with overwhelming odds so that you don't have a problem. You know, in, in a lot of cases, you're ruining somebody's life. So you don't know what they're going to do. So if you go in, uh, uh, in numbers, uh, it's going to prevent anything from happening. I'll just give a side story that we actually went to arrest a hacker one time. And the guy lived like two hours away from our office. And I really didn't want to have to drive two hours to get him two hours back. And I mean, he knew we had him. There was no question about it. So we actually called and scheduled a time to make the arrest. And uh, you know, I said, well, how about like Thursday? He goes, well, I'm kind of busy that day. How about like Tuesday? I said, oh, gee, I can't. I, I got something going. So we actually scheduled to meet at a restaurant across from the courthouse, had lunch, and then went across the street and he got arrested. So it's not all like what you see in the movies. And, and we didn't have to listen to him for two hours in the backseat of the car. So he was happy. We were happy. Justice was Done. Did you send him an Outlook calendar request? <laughs> I, I, I think he friended him on Facebook. Okay, uh, sticking with the theme of federal policy, um, I know uh, a couple years ago, DIAP wrote that 8570 that uh, required um, for the de department, department of Defense anyway, but I know a lot of other departments caught on board, uh, to have a civilian certification in order to uh, meet the, the prerequisites, uh, CISSP for some or CEH for other pieces. Um, is that a theme that we're looking at sticking with in the government to, to have these civilian certifications? Any standard the government comes up with is going to be a clusterfuck. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see, we're talking about technology here that depreciates like a head of lettuce that you throw into a fire, right? And so if, if you're gonna sit there and spend time and effort in trying to standardize something, only to throw it over the transom to the National Institute of Standards, and then maybe 13 to 18 months later they kind of give you an answer, that just sounds absurd. So we've gotta think differently. It's for the uh, NDU representative. Um, I just got done hiring a bunch of qualified security professional guys, and they're really, really expensive. Um, what do you see is the, is it better to hire people that have kind of come up through the ranks and made their own name for themselves, or is it better to hire them young and put them in, put them through all the training and hope to grow them internally? Hmm. Well, at, at DC3, we do both. Uh, yeah. If you went through DC3, you would find uh, old farts, uh, like, like rich, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and you'll have kids right out of, right out of college. You'll find uh, enlisted troops, young enlisted troops, right out of tech school, and, and and everything in between. It's a pretty eclectic group, and you look where where the t 